your monthly dose of astronomy news and views. This is Awesome Astronomy. Hello and welcome to episode 17 of Awesome Astronomy for November 2013. In a month when government shutdowns have threatened to strangle US space science and Comet Eisen slipped past Mars barely noticed, we bring you another astronomy-packed show to while away an hour of your time and distract you from the petty and insignificant meanderings of an Earth-centric existence. Coming up in this month's show, we have our usual sky guide to tempt you with all the observing highlights in November, a roundup of the latest astronomy news, the elusive and contested dark energy gets carefully explained in our five-minute concept, we have an interview with Dr. Gangnon at CERN about fundamental physics and the universe, and we round off, as always, answering the astronomy questions that you've been pondering yourselves. But before we get into it, I'm Ralph, your host for this month's show, and in order to reach the zenith of astronomy podcasting, I'm joined by our Sirius Among Stars, Paul. Hello, um, did you just call me a dog? No, well, uh, I meant brightest in its class, but perhaps comparing you to the dog star wasn't the kindest. Now, I'm (laughs) going to ask you in a minute about your observing during October, but without wanting to suggest that you're becoming a bit of a media hog, you were with the (laughs) BBC crews filming the Sky at Night yet again last month. Yeah, we we joined the team up on Blackheath behind the Grange Observatory to um, mm. attempt to look at the penumbral eclipse that was taking place on the the eighteenth. Unfortunately, it was clouded out, but lots ah. of ladies and gentlemen joined us. Um, we had Flamsteed Astronomy, Romsey Astronomy, and of course our own dear Baker Street Irregulars. Well, that sounds great, and you managed to get your hands on some chunks of the asteroid belt and some lunar yeah. samples too. Tell us about that. It, How well, cool that, was that? Oh, very cool. Um, yeah, it was with piece of the asteroid, an S-class meteorite, and a piece of the moon, um, space geologist Katie Joy. Um, very cool sounding, Manchester University Isotope Cosmochemistry Group. Wow. How cool, how cool is that? that yeah, I want that job title. <laughs> I want that job title. <laughs> yeah, um, she'd brought it along. Uh, so that was certainly worth the trip on a cloudy night by itself, so that was fantastic. So apart from a cloud of out penumbral eclipse, what have you been observing in October? Well, it's been a difficult month, isn't it? Um, this is sort of typical for October. Mm. It's been cloud, damp, quite a bit of mm-hmm. rain flying about. Um, I managed to squeeze in a bit of time with my uh, favourite planet, Uranus. Um, saw the, just had some last good looks at the summer triangle as it starts to sink in the west and uh, had some nice time sketching the moon. Um, how have you fared? Well, I've been trying to enjoy the clusters this time of year because if you scan around certain constellations like the region between Sagittarius mm. and Scutum and Cassiopeia oh, in yeah, particular... Yeah. You can reveal dozens of these clusters, and this kind of constellation scanning rather than pre-planned hops to specific objects or go-to selections can be so much random fun and really Mm. rewarding. But one event in particular I was looking forward to was the triple transit of three of Jupiter's moons on the 12th of October. But we were clouded out where we were. Now, fortunately, the internet shows no respect whatsoever for meteorology. And even if you missed special events like the penumbral eclipse that you nearly saw, mm-hmm. somebody's always going to send you an image of it. And oh, yeah. Christopher Orberg in Kumla, Sweden, managed to capture a great image of Jupiter and the shadows cast by its moons Io, Europa and Callisto. And I remember imaging transits of Jupiter's moons around opposition last December, which was great fun. But the shadows, obviously, at that time were directly in front of the moons from our line of sight. But here in Christopher's image, we see the three moons far away to the side of the planet and casting their pinpoint shadows on the gas giant laterally. And the angle of these moons' shadows will decrease as we move towards Jupiter's next opposition in January 2014. But it was great to see this event, even if it wasn't with my own eyes, because these triple transits only happen once or twice a decade. And if you want to see Christopher's triple transit image and mine from opposition, go to awesomeastronomy.com and scroll down to my article, the 2013 triple transit of Jupiter. And if you capture anything that you want to show off, do send your images in to us via Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod or post it up on the Facebook group where this month we also got a lovely image by Mary Spicer of the International Space Station forming a kind of T-shape as it moved perpendicular to an Iridium satellite that happened to flare up at the same time. This is Awesome Astronomy. Well, as the Northern Hemisphere is now offering us ever-lengthening night skies, here's Paul with our November Sky Guide to give you some observing inspiration. November. And for those of you living around latitude 50, the middle of the month will see you under night skies almost 15 hours long. By month's end, daylight is barely 8 hours in length. So we're into those long observing sessions where you'll see a parade of constellations through the night, starting with the last vestiges of late summer, working through autumn into winter, and ending the night with skies of early spring. In fact, you'll see stars like Arcturus and Vega set in the west and rise again in the east. And constellations like Hercules will grace the evening and morning skies, but be absent for most of the night. There's nothing like long winter nights to give you a sense of the sheer scale of it all. 
First though, a look at this month's planets. There is really only one serious contender for our observing affections this month, and that is Jupiter. The king will be rising around 8pm throughout the month, and is unmistakable sitting in the constellation of Gemini, blazing away at magnitude minus 2.25. It's in an area of sky that has its fair share of bright stars, and Jupiter will outshine them all, including the brightest Sirius, which can only manage minus 1.45 by comparison. Jupiter will climb high through the night and will be reaching 60 degrees in altitude from latitude 51 by the early hours. Look out for the four bright Galilean moons in binoculars and small telescopes, while larger scopes, it's all about cloud detail, the belts, and of course the great red spot. Now, this isn't always visible. Jupiter has a rotation period of shade under 10 hours, so until we are close to opposition and have Jupiter in the sky for 10 hours, there will be nights where the GRS is not pointed towards Earth. It's a surprisingly faint and difficult object to see. Many observing for the first time assume it stands out as it does in Voyager pictures. It does require patience sometimes, and a blue filter may be useful. Don't be tempted to rack up the magnification too high with Jupiter. While it is a big, bright object, it does tend to become stretched and blurry at the higher magnifications that telescopes are capable of, and I've certainly found that the contrast between the belts gets lost. Look out for features such as smaller storms and the brown barges, which appear to be very common on Jupiter during the 2011 apparition. When it comes to the other planets, it's a case of patience and or aperture. That's not to say that those with binoculars and small scopes shouldn't get out there and observe, but November is not going to be a great month for detail and long close views. We of course have Neptune in Aquarius, between Sigma and Iota Aquarii, which is becoming smaller and more distant all the time after the summer opposition is now touching magnitude 8. Uranus is in Pisces, close to Delta and Epsilon Piscium, and at magnitude 5.8 should be relatively easy to locate in a dark sky. Saturn is in conjunction with the Sun at the beginning of November, so it's not visible until much later in the month, in the constellation Libra, just before dawn. Working our way in past Jupiter, we get to Mars, which is still a very disappointing telescope target and still five months from opposition on April the 8th next year. It's currently in Leo and is a target for the early risers through the month. Venus reaches greatest eastern elongation on the 1st November, but like last month, this view is one low to the horizon in Sagittarius, around and after sunset. The thicker, dusty horizon will not help viewing, and the minus 4.3 magnitude planet, while bright, will not reveal anything in the way of cloud detail. The moon sits near Venus on the 6th, and Sigma Sagittarii gets a close visit on the 18th of the month. Mercury begins a month between us and the Sun at inferior conjunction, but of course the winged messenger does not hang about, and by the middle of the month it reaches greatest western elongation, which you can observe on the morning of the 16th. Now at this point it's worth talking about what will hopefully be one of the highlights of November, and indeed this winter, Comet Ison, which has finally arrived in our skies and the first decent views are being recorded around the world. It will plunge behind the sun when it reaches perihelion on the 28th of the month, but before then it will be providing a host of picture and observing opportunities as it poses with several of the planets, another comet and a bright star in the early hours. At the beginning of the month it's Mars, as it has been in October, that sits close to Ison as they move through Leo into Gemini. As Ison moves into Gemini, leaving the more sedate Mars behind, it will be joined by another comet, if one was not enough, Comet 2P Enk. The two will appear to converge through the month as they move through Gemini, with Ison passing close to the star Spica on the morning of November the 18th, while on the horizon below, Mercury will be tracing its western elongation. The morning of the 22nd, with an almost repeat performance on the 23rd, has to be one of the highlights of the astronomical year, as before dawn on the southeastern horizon, not only will you have two comets, about five degrees apart, you'll have Mercury and the icing on the cake, the returning Saturn, joining the party to make what could be an unforgettable sight. It'll be an event low to the horizon and not long before dawn, so make sure you get a good view in that direction, preferably with a bit of elevation, and hope for good weather. If that wasn't enough of an early morning itinerary, then three days later Mercury and Saturn will be in very close conjunction as viewed from northern Europe and northern America, separated by around 30 arc minutes in the pre-dawn sky on the 26th of November. Moving on to the moon, we begin the month with the new moon on the 3rd and the full moon on the 17th. In the first half of the month, look out for favourable libration craters, Petro on the 10th, Jenner on the 13th and Gibbs on the 15th, with a good view of the Mare Australe on the 12th. These can all be viewed in the southeastern quadrant. The moon also gives us a nice occultation on the night of the 23rd as it passes in front of M67 in Cancer, just before 10 o'clock in the evening, UT, with the cluster reappearing an hour later. Two meteor showers to view this month, with the first really being a two-for-one deal. The Taurids, which have a north and south stream, with the south peaking on the 4th, 5th of November and the north peaking on the 12th, 13th, are really two meteor streams, one from Comet 2 p Enk and the other from asteroid 2004 TG10, which is thought to be a fragment of Enk itself. It's actually a very long shower and has been with us since the beginning of September and won't end until December, but the zenithal rate is quite low and a 5.15 an hour is common at the peak. 
On the night of the 16th, 17th, we have the peak of the Leonids, which originate from Comet Temple Tuttle. The moon is unfortunately full on the 17th, so the good zenithal rate of over 30 will probably be badly obscured. Still worth a look, but the Taurids earlier in the month may be the better bet. Moving on to deep sky this month, I'll point you in the direction of three less observed constellations, Pisces, Sculptor and Cetus. These sit next to each other below Andromeda in the south in November, with Sculptor close to the horizon. In Pisces, we have Galaxy M74, a grand design spiral that sits face onto us at a distance of 32 million light years. While quite a large object, it's also notorious for low surface brightness and is considered by many to be the most difficult Messe object to observe. Pisces also contains the beautiful circular asterism of seven stars, which contains a fascinating 19 Piscium, or Piscium TX, which is obviously red and is a result of it being a carbon star. Cetus contains Galaxy M77 near Delta Ceti. This is a barred spiral about 47 million light years away and is an active galaxy, a surfeit type 2, and is thought to be one of the biggest galaxies in the Messier catalogue. Its central region is bright and compact and is visible even in quite small scopes. Cetus is also famous for the star Myra, a star that gives its name to a whole class of variable stars, and despite being over 400 light years away, it's so swollen that it is one of the two stars that have had their stellar disks imaged by Hubble. The constellation Sculptor is a difficult constellation for observers in the north, and never really climbs far above the horizon. It contains both the Sculptor Dwarf Galaxy, a member of our own local group, and the Sculptor Galaxy Group, which is the nearest group to our own. The Sculptor Galaxy, NGC 253, is the largest member, and a barred spiral sitting in the constellation towards Cetus. NGC 55 is an interesting irregular galaxy that sits between us and the Sculptor Group, and may be one of an independent pair with NGC 300. So, plenty to see in November. I wish you clear skies and remind you all to wrap up warm as you enjoy what the sky has to offer. This is Awesome Astronomy. In the news this month, we start off with some very sad news about the death of an American hero and pioneer of spaceflight, Mercury astronaut Malcolm Scott Carpenter, who died on the 10th of October, aged 88. And although Carpenter spent much time in assisting with the engineering of the Gemini spacecraft, the Apollo Lunar Lander, and served as Capcom, or Capsule Communicator, in mission control on numerous occasions, he only flew the one space mission, Aurora 7, and therefore perhaps gets unjustly overshadowed by some of the other astronaut household names. But Carpenter was selected as the backup to John Glenn on the first ever US orbital mission and became the second American to orbit the Earth in 1962 and in doing so became the fourth American in space. And reading his 2002 book, Four Spacious Skies, we saw that although he possessed the same skills, background and capabilities of his colleagues demonstrating the right stuff, he was also quite different to the astronaut stereotype. He was quite bohemian and romantic, enjoying playing guitar alone on Cocoa Beach writing love letters to his wife and left NASA to explore the depths of the seas in the ocean floor sea lab experiment. It's also sad that he was tainted with an unfair stain on his career due to landing the Aurora 7 spacecraft 250 miles off course. And flight director Chris Kraft wrote in his book that this was due to Carpenter being too fixated on his science objectives rather than concentrating on where his spacecraft was. But... As most controls and level indicators were more monitored by mission control than the Mercury astronauts themselves, and there had been an issue with previous Mercury capsule attitude readings, in all likelihood Carpenter actually did really well to take over the fully automatic controls and get so close to his intended landing point. But as he didn't fly again, he didn't get to redeem himself as Gus Grissom did by successfully flying Gemini 3 after his Mercury capsule hatch mysteriously blew open and his spacecraft sank. Also, interestingly, if Carpenter had stayed with NASA and continued flying, he may well have been the first man to walk on the moon. Oh, how so? Well, Chief Astronaut Deke Slayton, who chose the crews for the Apollo mission, said he wanted a Mercury astronaut to command the first moon landing. While Al Shepard and Deke himself were grounded due to medical conditions, Gus Grissom had died in the Apollo 1 fire, John Glenn and Wally Sherrard had retired from NASA, and Gordo Cooper had fallen out of favour by 1969. So if Carpenter had continued flying in Gemini and Apollo, there's a good chance he'd be in that pantheon of human explorers instead of Neil Armstrong. And with Armstrong himself sadly dying just last year, we're losing these space pioneers. It's so sad, we forget what these guys did with tin cans, rivets and 1950s electronics. And we only have John Glenn still alive to relive those Mercury days now. Yes, and even jumping forward to the Apollo days, out of, what, the 12 people who've ever walked on the moon, only eight alive can recall memories of that incredible three years when we achieved something far beyond the capabilities of that primitive engineering. And without wanting to sound gloomy, 
their ages range from 78 to 83, so there's a real likelihood that despite a public perception in the 1970s that mankind would push on from the Apollo era to colonise the moon and explore other solar system bodies, unless we get some human footprints on the moon in the next 10 to 20 years, we could see a day when we've spent so much time economising rather than striving and have no one living that's walked on the moon and no realistic hope mm. of anyone achieving it again in the foreseeable. Yeah, it's really sad. And we're not getting any cheerier with our next news item either. Oh, no. Because trying to avoid politics, a ridiculous stalemate in the US Congress forced a partial shutdown of the government, meaning that 800,000 government employees were on forced leave from their work for half of October. That means our beloved NASA suffered a skeleton staff to keep the manned spaceflight and current robotic missions afloat. But most other operations were suspended. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, largely survived because most of their staff are paid by the California Institute of Technology. But most non-critical functions of NASA were shut down, as you'll have seen if you tried to get on any of NASA's websites between the 1st and the 17th of October. And just this 16-day hiatus in operations and functions is likely to have set NASA back months in spacecraft design, build, research, reviews and education, just to get back to where they were before the budget squabbling. Have they seen Mars attacks? They really don't want to risk our wrath. And now the yodeling cowboy Slim Whitman's no longer around, nothing can stand in our way. Okay, let's lift the mood with some better news from the US, where the Curiosity rover, or Mars Science Laboratory, has shown that Martian rocks contain 2% water wherever they've been sampled. That means there's about two pints of water in every cubic foot of rock, according to Curiosity researcher Dr. Laurie Leshin. And this comes hot on the heels of news a few months ago that pH-neutral water once flowed on Mars too. Now, the reason we know this water is so abundant is because the Mars Science Laboratory has such a phenomenal suite of instruments on board – one of which is called Sample Analysis at Mars, which took broken-up rock samples, cooked them up, and used spectrometers and a gas chromatograph to detect the H2O and its abundances. And here, we have an important resource for future travellers to Mars because it means that ice water can be retrieved from rocks anywhere on the planet and used for drinking, which is far cheaper than sending periodic supplies on rockets for Mars explorers or colonists. Yeah, and this is, this is especially important when you consider that the shortest round trip to Mars would last six months to get there, six months to get back and stay on the red planet while you wait for an advantageous Mars-Earth alignment before blasting off again. Yeah, and this won't shorten the journey any, but it does have other advantages. Water can be split into hydrogen and oxygen through hydrolysis. And oxygen is obviously useful to breathe in any future Mars base, but it's also useful as a rocket fuel oxidizer, or air for the rocket propellant to breathe. And the hydrogen obtained is that propellant. So you've got rocket fuel in situ. Now, of course, this isn't going to be a simple extraction and utilization process when you're on another planet, but it's easier and cheaper than launching separate supplies or carrying the extra weight of fuel, oxygen and water needed for a six-month minimum stay. But the media have run away with the story that the biggest problem could be perchlorates. But perchlorates are good, aren't they? Well, they were when they were first discovered on Mars because they lower the freezing temperature of water, a bit like antifreeze, and that could allow water to exist in Martian aquifers or other pressurised environments. So it was good for the original search for water on Mars. But now that we know for certain that water not only flowed there but appears to be abundant in its rocks, it's actually a problem because there's a quarter as much perchlorate as H2O and perchlorates inhibit thyroid function, so that would need to be filtered out. But I was sceptical about the extent of this problem, so I spoke with Paul Sermon, a professor of chemistry in the UK, who explained that perchlorate can be extracted from water by numerous methods, the simplest being adsorption using clay, which is also abundant on Mars. So there are relatively easy ways of extracting the water from rocks and leaving the perchlorate behind, or running the water through indigenous clays and filtering the perchlorate out that way. But what we're really learning from this rover is that Mars is becoming a less hostile place all the time, Radiation doses at the surface aren't considered lethal anymore, drinkable water is abundant, and we've still got so much more to learn from the data already collected by the Mars Science Laboratory, and then there's the data it's yet to collect. And let's not forget that despite these great findings, the rover hasn't even reached its intended science-gathering region on Mars yet. And you have some good news from the European Southern Observatory too. Yes, 
ALMA, or the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, is nearing completion with its final 12-meter dish being installed as we speak. ALMA is the cutting edge in astronomy instrumentation in these millimeter submillimeter wavelengths of light and sits high up in the Chilean desert with 66 of these huge dishes now. And the more dishes you have, the more resolution or clarity you get to your images. And ALMA will give us the best images ever of cold and distant objects in the universe. So with the construction phase of this project now completed, we look forward to finding out more new things about this universe and unraveling more of its mysteries with ALMA. And finally, we turn to the European Space Agency, who don't have the budget or the resources of NASA, but when they commit something, they look for quite incredible missions. And the ESA mission due to launch on the 20th of this month is no exception when it comes to doing truly incredible things. Because without much fanfare and little PR, ESA's Gaia mission is going to revolutionise our understanding of the universe, similar to our expectations for ESA's Rosetta missions to land on and sample a comet next year and their search for life on Mars mission, ExoMars. And if any of you use telescopes or star charts, you'll probably be familiar with the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, or SAO catalogue, of some 260,000 stars, or the HD Henry Draper catalogue of 360,000 stars, or maybe the HIP and Tycho catalogues created by ESA's Hipparchus spacecraft in the early 1990s, which takes our catalogue in up to 2.5 million stars. Now, ESA looked for a more precise star mapping successor to Hipparchus as soon as the mission was over, and the proposal for an astrometry satellite, as they're known, that would map around 20 million stars was rejected by the European Space Agency as not being ambitious enough. The chosen mission was this one, Gaia, and its aims are only possible through advancements in technology, particularly sensor sensitivity, silicon carbide materials that won't significantly expand or contract in space, and laser interferometry to assist in the most accurate measurements possible. So, what is this incredible spacecraft going to do? Well, it'll scan the skies and take the most precise measurements ever of more than one billion stars in our galaxy. That's one billion. And that's not all. That would be impressive enough on its own, but to be truly revolutionary, it's also capable of detecting tens of thousands of exoplanets, thousands of brown dwarf stars, free-roaming planets, Kuiper Belt objects, asteroids, comets and near-Earth objects. So, a bit of everything, really. And there's a cosmology component too, because its unprecedented accuracy will reveal negligible gravitational effects and help us to test Einstein's theory of general relativity with ever more precision. It'll detect 20,000 supernovae every year before they reach full brightness, allowing the world's telescopes advance warning of these elusive objects. And it should recognise the remnants of dwarf galaxies that have been ripped apart and smeared so finely by the Milky Way's gravity that they can't normally be seen. And this will allow astronomers to better understand this galactic archaeology, as they call it. Yeah, it's really become the mark of European spacecraft, this packing in the technology and trying to get as much science out of the mission as possible. I think we saw this with the Planck and Herschel missions, mm -hmm. which Chris North talked about last yeah. episode. Uh, ESA's beginning to get a bit of a reputation for benchmark-setting spacecraft built on tight budgets. So mm -hmm. when's Gaia due to launch again? Well, it's launch windows between the 18th of November and the 5th of December this year, with the ESA countdown clock suggesting a first attempt on the 20th of November from French Guyana, and it should begin drip-feeding results from the middle of 2014. This is Awesome Astronomy. And now we have one of the hottest and least understood topics in cosmology. Dark energy or vacuum energy hasn't been detected, only inferred, and that leaves many astronomers feeling quite uncomfortable. But we're not here to tell you what to believe, only what we know. So to explain the phenomenon we call dark energy, it's over to Paul. If humanity survives long enough, the distant future will be a lonely one. If we manage to survive cometary impacts, pandemics, the eventual death of the sun, and of course, most importantly, ourselves... The sky our very distant descendants will gaze upon will, in a weird way, be the sort of universe we believe it to be barely more than a century ago. A galactic island universe, alone in splendid isolation. Just a large elliptical galaxy, already named Milcomeda, sitting in an inky infinite void. No other galaxies visible, just darkness. It of course all started with the Big Bang, the universe expanding from a point smaller than an atom, inflating dramatically, then while slowing down from this dramatic increase within the first second, continuing to expand. The universe we see is bigger and more expansive than was the case in the distant past, and thanks to the work of Edwin Hubble, we know that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it appears to be receding from us, a cosmological rule known as Hubble's Law. I say appears because we hold no special place in the universe. 
We are not at the centre, with everything receding from us. If we were to stand in any distant galaxy, we would get the same observation, that everywhere else was racing away from where we stood. This, of course, has been the model of Big Bang since the middle of the 20th century, an expanding universe with every megaparsec we travel from here adding around another 70 kilometres a second to the speed. But there was an important set of questions. Would this always be so? Would the universe expand forever? Would gravity eventually win out and pull it all back together again in a big crunch? A majestic infinite expansion or an almighty rebound back to atomic-sized oblivion? The answer was unexpected. Not entirely, some models of the universe predicted it, but it was not the expected answer for a very good reason. It didn't really seem possible. Examination of type 1a supernova in distant galaxies was used in the early 90s to measure what was called the deceleration parameter. The very name suggests what the cosmologists were expecting to find. But the findings of two separate studies gave a negative answer, the very opposite of expectation. The universe, we now think, will not collapse. It will continue to expand, but the surprising element of the answer is that the rate of expansion is accelerating. The universe is expanding at an ever faster rate. No majestic expansion at the rate of the Hubble law, this. What astronomers recorded is a universe racing away ever faster towards galactic isolation. Which, if you think about it, is pretty counterintuitive. Our usual experience of things like explosions or debris from collisions suggests that expansion slows over time. What is going on? This is where the theory of dark energy steps in, and I'm afraid it's a bit of a leap. The universe you see is a tiny fraction of what there is. Now, in some respects, you should be familiar with that idea. Much of the electromagnetic spectrum, such as ultraviolet, gamma rays and radio waves, are invisible to our own eyes, and we use other instruments to observe them. We look out at the sky, and what we see is just a visible fraction of the spectrum. But this goes further. Here is an energy that no instrument we currently have can observe, and not only that, but this energy accounts for the vast majority of stuff in the universe. In fact, the theory is asking you to look at the sky and accept that what you see is just 4.5% of the matter and energy in the universe. Dark energy accounts for a whopping 68%. It is invisible, it is the dominant form, it is everywhere, and it is making the universe expand ever faster. So what is it? Well, the world of cosmology would love to be able to give a definitive answer, and it is surely a Nobel Prize in the waiting, but the answer at present is, well, in the dark. There are many theories, but we can group them into three broad categories, a cosmological constant, quantum vacuum energy, and quintessence. The first is perhaps the simplest, but for many cosmologists the least satisfying. Perhaps the universe just has an intrinsic something that makes this happen. The price of space in the universe we see is a cosmological constant lambda that drives expansion in the same way that Big G, Newton's gravitational constant, just is a constant in the life of the observable universe. It is what it is because that is what the universe is like. It is an empirical physical constant, an anthropic quality, that if it were changed would not allow the universe to be how it is observed. It's the simplest answer, but that doesn't sit happy with many in the field. Saying it just is sounds like shoulder shrugging, and scientists hate shoulder shrugging. Next up is an explanation rooted in quantum physics. Now don't go and make the coffee. I know quantum physics is weird and counterintuitive, and this bit certainly is but stick with me here. There is energy in a vacuum. You know that thing with nothing in, a total absence of stuff, energy in fields? Well, it still has energy. One of the core principles of quantum theory is the idea of uncertainty, the Heisenberg uncertainty. You can know where a particle is precisely, but not its energy, or we can know its energy more precisely, but not its position. If we have a box of nothing, then we break this rule. If we say a special box has no particles or fields in it at all, i.e. energy state zero, then we know both position and energy state, and that is not allowed. And, well, that's where our minds begin to melt, but the upshot is that vacuums have energy. We can see this in an experiment called the Casimir effect. If you place two uncharged conducting plates close to each other in a vacuum, they will be attracted to each other, and negative pressure is created. Yes, in a vacuum. Because of uncertainty, virtual particles and their antiparticles are constantly popping in and out of existence all the time, and they provide the vacuum energy we observe in experimentation. The universe is filled with the negative energy this uncertainty creates. What's the difference with the cosmological constant? Well, it is possible to measure this energy and calculate its density, 
Problem is, it comes out 120 orders of magnitude too strong. If this is dark energy, the force provided would be explosive. It would expand, well, like inflation appears to at the beginning of the universe. And I'll let you sit and ponder that in your own good time. The last idea is named after the fifth element the Greeks listed after earth, air, fire and water, quintessence, or the stuff the heavenly bodies were made of. Today it is used for the theory that the universe contains a form of exotic matter or an energy that fills the cosmos, exerting this negative pressure. Does that sound a bit far out, a bit woohoo, maybe a bit luminiferous ether for many tastes? Well, remember that just over a century ago we thought we were alone in splendid isolation, living in a galactic island universe. Now how weird would that be? This is Awesome Astronomy. So for the interview this month, I was joined by Dr. Pauline Gagnon, a senior research scientist specialising in elementary particles and high energy physics at Indiana University. Pauline's currently working at the European Centre for Nuclear Research, or CERN, in Geneva on the Atlas experiment, looking for Higgs particles decaying into dark matter particles and engaging in CERN outreach. And I started our interview by asking Pauline about the goals of CERN when it started in 1959 and its goals today. The goal of CERN has always been the same. It's been to gain a better understanding of what are the fundamental uh, constituents of matter, what are the smallest grain of matter that all matter is made of, and to figure out how these uh, grains of matter interact uh, among themselves. So we study the fundamental uh, particles in matter, as well as the fundamental forces that act on those particles. And you're doing this with the Large Hadron Collider now, which is this gargantuan physics experiment that's underway underneath the Swiss and French countryside. Can you tell me what the LHC is hoping to do? Oh, there's so much on our plate with the LHC. You know, this is a machine that can produce incredible amount of energy. And this, the way we work is that we produce collisions between protons. So there are two beams of protons that collide at the, at the speed of light, mm -hmm. and they come into collision in the middle of our detector. So we have two things. We have the accelerator that accelerates the protons to create this amount of energy, and then we have detectors that are positioned around the point of collision to grab every fragment that comes out to try to be able to figure out what happened. So we have those detectors are just like giant cameras. So what we want to achieve is to create particles that we don't see nowadays, but that existed soon after the Big Bang when there was lots of energy available in the universe and those particles could be created. Because energy and matter are just two forms of the same essence. So you can see matter like congealed energy. Mm -hmm. It's exactly like water and ice. Ice is just frozen water. The same way you could see matter as being frozen energy. Mm -hmm. So it really works the same. So when we put a lot of energy in one point, we can create particles of matter. And the more energy we put, the bigger the particles we can create. This is why the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, can is such a great tool because it we never we were never able to produce that much energy before. So we can create particles that are much heavier than anything we had created before, which is why we were able to see the Higgs boson, because none of the accelerators built before were powerful enough to produce it in large quantities enough to observe it. Mm -hmm. And the energies are going to be going up even more, aren't they, with the next exactly. time that the collider gets started up? That's it. Well, we're going to nearly double the energy now in 2015. We're on a technical stop right now to upgrade the, the, the accelerator to reach this... Uh, uh, nominal energy, in fact, but we need to consolidate uh, the accelerator for that. There was also lots of uh, maintenance needed after uh, three years of operation. Well, something of particular relevance to your research and to our listeners will be the search for dark matter, this elusive substance that seems to make up five times more stuff in the universe than everything that we can see around us. Can you tell us what we think dark matter is and why? Yeah, well, it's not as elusive as you might think. You know, we have many, many proofs of its existence. 
The only problem is that we haven't been able to get our hands on it. Mm -hmm. But we see its effects. We see its footprints all over the place. So it's, uh, you know, it's like you're looking at a field of snow and you see the footprints. It's not because you haven't seen the animal passing by that it's not there, but you, you really see the tracks. So there ought to have been this animal passing. It's not because you have not seen it that it's not there. So we do see the dark matter, but not with visible light. We see it through its gravitational effects. And there are many, many uh, proofs of it. For example, through gravitational lensing, it can manifest itself. So dark matter acts like a lens with, uh, with the light, and it distorts the space such that light coming from other objects doesn't travel on a straight line, but will curve around it will curve around uh, a large amount of uh, matter, such as dark matter. So mm -hmm. we can see that there is dark matter because we see those effects created by lenses from invisible objects. So it's invisible in the sense that it does not emit light, but we can still feel its effect. And is the hope that the Large Hadron Collider will be able to create some of these particles? Indeed. So... It would be really great. For example, the fact that it has mass. We know it has mass because it generates a gravitational field. Mm -hmm. We know that the Higgs boson couples to objects that have mass. When I say couple, it means that it can it can decay into particles that have uh, that have mass. So one uh, field of research that I have worked on was exactly that: looking for Higgs boson that might decay into particles of dark matter. Oh, right. We have not found it yet. But this was one possibility. This is one, one way to look for the dark matter with the LHC, but there are many other ways. For example, we, we have now a theory, the standard model of uh, particle physics, that explains just about everything that we see for visible matter. Mm -hmm. So the, the type of matter that accounts for 5% of the content of the universe. But that 5%, I mean all stars, all galaxies, pulsars, quasars, you name it, whatever objects we have seen in the universe, it counts for that. Atoms, quarks, leptons, those are the basic uh, constituents of all that matter. Mm -hmm. So that 5%, we have a theory to describe it, which is called the standard model. But we know that our theory is incomplete. I often like to say that this theory that we have is a bit like in mathematics you know, for a long time. People were only only knew about arithmetics and the four basic operations: addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. And you know that with those four uh, operations, we can do just about everything that we need uh, in our uh, daily uh, life. But once in a while, you need a bit more than that. You need to uh, geometry. You need uh, trigonometry. You need uh, calculus. So. We think that the standard model that we have now is the equivalent of the four basic equations in mathematics. We know that mathematics is way bigger, so we need to discover what is this more encompassing theory that would build on the standard model, but that would go and take us further and would explain what is dark matter, what is dark energy. So what we know right now, what we see is only the tip of the iceberg. What we have discovered in physics to explain the material world only explains 5% of the material world around us. So we need to expand our theory, build on what we already know, go further than the current model, which is called the standard model. And maybe it's a theory like, there are lots of theories around, but one that is very popular is called supersymmetry. So supersymmetry would be a theory that builds on the standard model but allows us to explain dark matter, for example, or would fix all sorts of the flaws of the, of the standard model. Mm -hmm. But don't get me wrong, that standard model is goddamn good. It's <laughs> really, really good. For example, we, it makes predictions. We have confirmed some of the predictions of the standard model to the ninth decimal. Mm -hmm. So it makes extremely precise uh, predictions, and we can confirm that. Yeah. But there are some things that we know don't work. For example, dark matter. It has nothing to explain that. And that's the beauty of supersymmetry. Supersymmetry was invented by some theorists to fix some problems of the, dark, uh, of, of the standard model. One of them is that we know that at higher energies, the, the equations of the standard model are going to fail. 
So that's a known fact. Mm -hmm. Supersymmetry would kind of fix all that. So it was invented for that very problem. But more recently, people realized that within supersymmetry, supersymmetry is a theory that comes with lots of particles, new particles. And some of them would be perfect candidates to describe the dark matter. So a theory that explained that came for something completely different would be perfect to solve another problem. So that would be a nice, uh, would be killing two birds with one stone. So that that's one that is appealing for many reasons, but that's another one. So we hope that with the LHC, to answer your earlier questions, that we might be able to find what we call new physics, something that brings us further than the standard model mm -hmm. and to, to get a bigger understanding of matter around us, of the material world. What we really hope to find the, the secret passage to this uh, new theory, find a way, a, a crack, some, something leading us to understanding what is out there that we haven't seen. Maybe, as I said, that all that we know with the standard model is the equivalent of the four basic operations of arithmetic. And so far, it's been good, good enough to fill everything that we, uh, we do uh, in our uh, laboratories. So it's a good theory, but we need to go further. Yes. And if we come on to the discovery um, last year about the Higgs boson, which got a lot of justified public acclaim, can you tell us what the Higgs boson is now and why it's so important? The Higgs boson is the proof that what François Anglais, Robert Braut and uh, Peter Higgs uh, imagined that there was this field of force, this special uh, field that permeates the whole universe, and that field appeared just after the Big Bang, this is kind of the fabric of the universe. This field is there. And when fundamental particles, like electrons and quarks, move within that field, it, they experience some sort of a drag force that slows them down. And they, they feel more massive, and it, it gives them mass. They're not able to move at the speed of light anymore. And this is really crucial because the, the fact that all those particles are slowing down makes it possible for quarks to assemble and form protons and neutrons. Mm -hmm. So without it, we would not form matter. So the Higgs field is extremely important. So the Higgs boson is not what gives uh, matter to all the elementary particles. It is just the proof that there is a field that does that. And Peter Higgs and Francois Engler won the Nobel Prize for this theory of the mechanism in the 1960s and got the Nobel Prize just recently. CERN put the effort in and found it. Do you feel a little bit disappointed that CERN didn't share in the Nobel Prize? Well, it would have been fun, of course, but it's still great because we're, uh, nomina we're uh, explicitly named in the text of the Nobel Prize, uh, the, the citation mm -hmm. to the Nobel Prize that the two experiments, CMS and ATLAS, operating on the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So those four acronyms are there. So it's it's good. <laughs> We're there. And it's also, uh, it's clear that without us finding it, there would not, not have been a Nobel Prize for this theory because unproven theories, the libraries are full of them. You know, all the journals there are filled with papers of ideas that people had but that, are, that still remain to be proved, mm -hmm. so proven. So in, in physics, we don't believe in a theory until it is proven. Like right now, I spoke to you about supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. It is just still a theory, some figment out of the, the mind of many theorists. Many people believe in it because it's quite likely that it's true. It has all sorts of good features, but until we find the signs of it, and the signs are there are lots of particles coming with this theory, new particles, and we should uh, find them. Otherwise, we'll have to say that it has to be ditched. It's no good. And these new particles that you would need to, to show the existence of supersymmetry that you expect to find, is that something that you expect to find on the near horizon? Should the LHC be able to find this, or would we be looking for next generation colliders to provide enough energy to find these particles? You know, it's it's there's never any guarantees. You no, know, we're uh, we're told by the theorists, okay, there is a whole zoo of particles out there. You know, there are tons of beasts running wild, and you should be able to uh, to find them. But nice, but nobody tells us exactly what those uh, animals look like. 
we we have uh, supposed to set up traps to find them, but no. Should we put a, a trap with a reser- uh, with a spring, or should we put something with a fast uh, uh, falling uh, gate? Or no? How do you catch those bees when you don't even know what they look like? So yeah. it's not it's not obvious. So so far we have been looking in many many different uh, directions. We're we're trying to not leave any stone unturned. We're trying to set up traps of all sorts. But it's possible that we have not set up the right trap yet. It's also possible that we don't have quite enough energy right now with the LHC to find it. Yeah, you'd like the energies. <laughs> so as you said, in 2015, we will be finished with this upgrade and then we will be at nearly twice the energy. So we hope that by then we will stand way more chances of finding it. If we don't find it with the LHC at uh, its nominal ener- energy of 13 or 14 tera electron volts, TEV. If we don't find it, then the theory will come in serious uh, jeopardy. You know, it will be less credible. Uh-huh. But we still have so much territory to explore. Yeah. But everything that we measure, every single aspects of any property that we measure, all wo- always uh, shrinks the 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 news around the neck of those particles so eventually we should be able to zoom on something if they're there if they're not there if we don't find it with the lhc it will become a bit less uh, probable that this theory is right then theorists will have to go back to their uh, drawing board and think about it differently Mm -hmm. And if we look into some of the other corners of physics and astronomy, there's also a possibility that the Large Hadron Collider could see hints of extra dimensions, if they exist at all. Can you tell me about this? Yes. Again, the extra dimensions should come with very special particles called Calusa Klein excitations and all that. And these, we should find signs of those particles as well with the LHC. So there is also research going on in that direction. This is the beauty of the Large Hadron Collider. It's a big machine, it's an expensive one, but we are really doing lots of interesting physics with it. So we can look not only at specific things, but in many, many directions. It's quite an interesting instrument for that because it allows to do all sorts of things. It allows us to go back to the time of the Big Bang, creating energy that only existed fractions of a second after the Big Bang, and really see what happened at the very beginning of the universe. It allows us to expand our understanding of the material world to great precision. It uh, should allow us to uh, have a glimpse at what is dark matter. And so it's really opening all sorts of doors uh, in research. And the other thing that is really neat, too, is that in doing so, we are forced to invent all sorts of things. And there are all sorts of uh, spin-offs that Mm. uh, come from this fundamental research. That's the beauty of fundamental research. All money that is invested comes back in uh, returns of all sorts. For example, in medicine, in uh, medical imaging, in new techniques to fight cancer instead of uh, uh, radiation to treat uh, cancer of a tumor. Mm. We can use uh, proton uh, beams, and it's way more efficient and uh, less damageable to uh, the, the patient. So... There's also a development in the communications. The World Wide Web, for example, comes from CERN. Mm-hmm. We develop a technology in a vacuum, in material sciences, in uh, electronics, you name it. So it's it's really also paying off in many, many ways. And of course, there's those serendipitous discoveries that we don't know is going to be on the horizon. That's it. You know, a hundred years ago, physicists were playing with the electron, you know, studying the electrons, for example. Who would have uh, thought then this understanding would help develop all the electricity, electronics? No, we would not have any computers. We would not have the telecommunications that we know today. So all the research that is done pays off on the long term. And not only long term, but often short term. That's the case with the World Wide Web. It has simply changed the way we live today. Completely, yeah. And um, to finish off, what specifically is your research currently focusing on? Until very recently, I was uh, working on this uh, thing of looking for the Higgs boson going into um, uh, dark matter particles. And I was also looking for dark matter uh, appearing in our detectors in the form uh, of uh, some uh, electrons and the muons in some specific ways that we could find. 
But more recently now, I am uh, concentrating more on outreach activities and uh, writing blogs for CERN on Quantum Diary. So my job is, I have the best job at CERN, in fact. My job <laughs> is to talk about and only about the most interesting things uh, that are happening in the lab. So that's quite great. <laughs> Well, I'd wish you luck with that, but it sounds like you've already got all that luck. Um, it's been great to speak with you on Awesome Astronomy and find out all about the frontiers of science that CERN's permitting us to explore that will and already are changing our understanding of the universe. Dr. Pauline Gagnon, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Wow, really incredible stuff. And it shows that CERN isn't just about the Higgs and that the research hasn't ended because they found it. Well, if we do get these hints of supersymmetry that Pauline seems quite optimistic about, the Higgs will just be a mere warm-up act Mm. to to what else is out there. This is Awesome Astronomy. Well, now we give you the chance to ask that question about astronomy that's always mystified you, confused you, or just doesn't sound right, the Q&A section. And for future episodes, if you want to put a question to us... And there's no such thing as a stupid question... You can tweet it to us at awesomeastropod, email it to the show at awesomeastronomy.com, ask away on our Google Plus page or join our Facebook group where we'll put a thread up each month asking for questions to discuss on the show. Okay, so first up is a question from Mark Kittering in London, England, which Paul is going to tackle, and Mark asks, with the discovery that the universe is a mass of free-floating planets thrown clear of their orbits, what are the chances of us detecting a rogue planet passing through our solar system? And if so... Would we have even noticed one passing in the past? Rogue planets, um, yeah, who would have thought it, eh? A few years ago, pretty much science fiction and mad prophecy. Um, and now we know the sky's full of them, wandering the cosmos like lost sheep. So let's start with what they are for anyone out there unfamiliar with one of astronomy's more recent and more surprising discoveries. Using a series of observations based on the technique of microlensing, a feature of relativity where astronomers look for a sudden brightening of a background star as an object passes in front. In 2011, this survey by Japanese astronomers observed 50 million stars and extrapolated from the lensing events they recorded that there are two free floaters, what they called them, for every star. Uh, While subsequent studies suggest there could be 100,000 nomad planets for every star in the galaxy. So what are they and where did they come from, I hear you cry? What are they? Where do they come from? Well, they are believed to be two broad types, those that are formed around stars within planetary systems and are subsequently ejected, and those that form in the same way as stars out in stellar space. Now, the second category, the IOU has suggested, are probably more likely to be failed stars or sub-brown dwarf objects, uh, a category of gas giant that sits between Jupiter and the minimum of 13 Jupiter masses required for some sort of nuclear fusion to occur. Now, as for the first category, it's now thought that most multiple planet systems, including our own, lose at least one planet during formation due to gravitational interactions. So somewhere out there, our solar system probably has a lonely missing member. OK, OK, what about us? What about us? OK, so to look directly at the question, what would happen if one wandered into or even passed near to the solar system, would we notice? So it's probably better to look at the likelihood of this happening first, and that's where I will point you in the direction of the bad astronomy blog of the excellent insailing Phil Plate. He did some simple maths on the distribution of these things and points out that at best you will find 0.01 rogues per cubic light year. So that works out at one planet per 100 cubic light years. Now, of course, the galaxy is a vast place and planets are very, very small. Well, except that as Phil points out, 100 cubic light years works out as a sphere about three light years in radius. So potentially there is one of these oddities closer than the nearest star. But let's not get carried away. A sphere six light years across is a vast volume of sky and planets really are very tiny, even Jupiter-sized ones. Something like a ping pong ball compared to the volume of the Earth-Moon system. So, first of all, chances of us coming across one, even nearby, are very, very slim. But what if one did come close, but not enter the solar system? Well, we probably wouldn't notice. You might just get a new comet as a result, as the rogue's gravity nudges an Oort cloud object inwards. Of course, the chances again are slim, and in many ways, so what? We have new comets all the time, and we probably just get excited by it, like ISON. Uh, We have no idea what actually nudges long-period comets on their epic journeys, so... No threat, and certainly not the apocalyptic predictions of a mass-heavy bombardment as hundreds of new comets fly in. But what about one flying into the actual solar system? Stop teasing us. OK, OK. The heart of the question and the bit of the answer you probably want to hear is, well, is it going to have an effect? 
if a rogue passes right through the heart of the solar system, it's going to disrupt orbits. It's going to change a few things. Now, the effects might be subtle, depending on the position of the planets at the time. A Mercury-sized object passing through our orbit while we're on the other side of the Sun is likely to have very little effect. While a Jupiter-sized mass passing by close to Earth is, of course, going to tip a few Newtonian apple carts. Of course, it may mean the solar system gains a planet, and again, the long-term effects of this extra mass will be felt over time. A small change in Earth's orbit, perhaps making it slightly more elliptical, could be devastating for life. Certainly, it might mess up the timing of the school holidays. Now, it's worth mentioning a thing called planetary migration, which is a theory tied up with our discovery of hot Jupiters in close orbits to stars. Now, these planets can't have formed where they're found, so it's proposed that they've migrated in. What this means for small planets like ours when computer models are run is that they get destroyed or ejected from the system. But that's a forming systems, not form stable planets and wandering rogues. So it doomed! <sighs> but, as I said, it's all highly unlikely and talk of Nibiru destroying the Earth is madder than a box of badgers. So you can come back in now, Ralph. Phew. Unlike astrology, which is totally legit. <sighs> no, it's not. What's getting into you this month, foolish man? Okay, so next up we have a question via Google Plus from Etienne Moran in Gatineau, Quebec, Canada. And a nice little thought experiment it is too. If we were able to dig a tunnel from one side of the Earth to the other side and passing by the centre of our planet, what would be the effect of gravity on us if we stand in this tunnel in the centre of the Earth? I know we would be fried. Pretend we have the best air conditioner in our tunnel. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right about the temperatures, Etienne. The Earth's core is a nickel iron ball around 5,700 Kelvin, and that's equivalent to temperatures around the surface of the sun. But if we put that to one side and say, hypothetically, you could sit at the Earth's center without falling foul of the heat and pressures of three and a half million atmospheres... <laughs> We can focus solely on the Earth's gravity. So, standing on the Earth's surface, we feel the downward pull of the full gravitational effect of the Earth's mass, what we call 1G, which equates to an unhindered free-falling object accelerating at 9.8 metres per second squared. Or put another way, accelerating at 9.8 metres per second each and every second. Of course, in real life, we have an atmosphere to contend with that provides wind resistance and an end to the acceleration after around 12 seconds. But if you could free fall towards the centre of the Earth without wind resistance in a perfect vacuum, you'd notice your 9.8 metres per second squared acceleration at the surface also slows as you descend towards the centre. And that's because the totality of Earth's mass is no longer under your feet pulling you only downwards. It's increasing to the side and above you. And all that mass, therefore, has an ever-increasing gravitational tug on you both from the sides and from above. Now, to prevent you splatting into the core that you want to sit in, we're going to have to drill that hole all the way through the Earth to the other side because your velocity when you reach the centre will be a whopping 7,900 metres a second. <laughs> but at the moment you're in the absolute centre, you're weightless. Or more accurately, the Earth's gravity is pulling on you with the same force in every conceivable direction. Now, after whizzing past the centre of the Earth at 17,700 miles an hour, <laughs> you'll continue travelling all the way until you reach the ground on the other side of the world after falling for a total of 42 minutes, where you'd run out of forward momentum and begin accelerating back to your starting point at 9.8 metres per second squared on an 84-minute round trip. <laughs> and that mirrors Hooke's law, doesn't it? It does. It's like a spring with a weight at one end. You'd oscillate back and forth from one end of the Earth to the other until you held on either at your starting point or your destination. <laughs> Hypothetically, you know, this isn't possible for so many <laughs> reasons, but those figures I mentioned earlier, an 84-minute round trip and a velocity at the centre of 17,700 miles an hour might sound mm. a little familiar. Yeah, they're very close to orbital time and speeds, aren't they? Exactly. In fact, if the International Space Station could orbit just above the surface of the Earth, it would have to travel at 17,700 miles an hour, and it would take 84 minutes to complete mm -hmm. a single orbit. So whether you go the direct route through the Earth or you travel in an orbital arc to the other side of the world, your time and speed is determined by the Earth's gravity. It's all simple maths and geometry. But if you could sit in the centre of the Earth, Etienne, you would feel weightless. And our final question comes from Darren Knight in Cambridgeshire, who asks us both, do you get up really early or go to bed really late? And I'm assuming <laughs> this is asked about our observing habits. So, Paul, are you a lark or a night owl? I, I have to admit to being a night owl. I, I stay up late, but mm -hmm. early mornings, 
uh, they yeah rare for me <laughs> rare for me I, I i make many plans to get up and see some of the the, the things i've talked about in the sky the sky guide earlier on you um, should only see one four o'clock and each then day. yeah then i normally wake up and think oh no <laughs> so for me i it's it's starting in the evening and and going as late as i i think i can and then turning in yeah that uh, exactly the same for me i'm mm-hmm. definitely a night owl um, if you if you're observing the uh, the, the pre midnight, it just fits in so much better with your lifestyle well, for yeah. lots of people anyway. And yeah. and then purposefully getting up and setting up a scope in the pre dawn sky, it's um, it has to be something very rare and something really exciting to get you up. And yeah. I'd like to think that you know a first glimpse of Jupiter or what oh. you were talking about in your sky guide about the comet and yeah. the planets aligning that and, would get me up in the morning. And that said, the skies are are better. In the morning, they're usually the seeing's better, the transparency yes. usually improves. You get better views in the yeah, morning. Yeah, you, you do, and and it is worth doing. But you know, life just sometimes tells you to stay in bed. <laughs> it's yeah, I, it's. I mean, it's. I've I've pulled a few all nighters yeah. in the past. Um, I mean, we we've certainly done. Well, if you think about the transit yeah. of Venus last year yeah. that we saw and yeah. the total eclipse, you know those kind of things mm. would get you up in the morning, regardless of of how early it was going to be, That's or you'd right. stay up all That's night right. for there, it. There but, some... but it has to be something quite spectacular, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, think we we've done an all nighter um, in the New Forest a little while ago, and I think we were really, oh, yeah. do you remember? We were really surprised when we started seeing things pop over the horizon, and mm. we were like, "What the that?" I was like, it's Jupiter. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the Pleiades. Venus is there. What's the Pleiades doing this time of year? Oh, yeah, we it's don't mid- observe in the morning. It was the middle of summer and suddenly <laughs> the Pleiades was popping up. What's that about? <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, I, yeah, I'm an evening observer mainly. It's, uh, yeah, I don't. It just doesn't fit in with work to get up at <laughs> sort of three o'clock yeah, in the morning. Your answer, yeah, there's Darren. We are, we are definitely <laughs> night owls, and uh, it has to be something quite spectacular to get us up in the morning. Cause definitely. We're just too too lazy to uh, to get up and observe yeah. them. Yeah. But observing in the first half of the night just allows you to chill out after a hard day and enjoy the skies, and maybe even a glass or two of cider and your mm. wine. But the most important thing is that you're listening to awesome astronomy while you observe. Oh, definitely. Avoid the heat ray. <laughs> Well, that's just about all for this month, but if you'd like to read Dr. Pauline Gagnon's Quantum Diaries blog for CERN and find out more about the topics we discussed in this month's interview, just head to www.quantumdiaries.org slash author slash CERN. And before we shut the generators down and raise the shields again for another month, we'd just like to ask you for some feedback on the new website. So please do tweet us at AwesomeAstroPod, email us at the show at awesomeastronomy.com, or post up on Facebook or Google Plus with any suggestions for content you'd like to see on the website. It's all to help amateur astronomers, and any suggestions are gratefully received. Also, there are now more ways to listen or get involved via that website at www.awesomeastronomy.com, with a lot more ideas for the YouTube versions that will include more animations and clips as you watch. And if you do like the show, please leave us a review on iTunes as it gives us more visibility on there and allows us to bring astronomy to wider audiences. No, Paul, don't shut everything down just yet. Well, I'm, I'm finished now. Yes, but I've got to close out the show. This is important too. No, no, it's only admin. It's only admin. Paul? Paul? Until the first of next month, it's goodbye from side on your base. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins, Paul Hill, Damian Phillips, and John Wildridge, and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more astronomy news, views, help, and advice, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group, and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. 
We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Pete Conrad, Apollo 12 commander, mm. died on a motorcycle, came off a motorcycle in a place called Ojai, California. Ojai being the Indian name for moon. Uh, Buzz Aldrin's mum's maiden name was Moon. Hmm. 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 Coincidence, probably. <laughs> Definitely. <clears throat>